another man with a beard presenting today. It seems to be the, the way to go. Um, I'm not presenting on apps, I'm presenting on telehealth, so something else that really pisses off a lot of um, clinicians around the area. Um, telehealth is video consultations, uh, communicating through video. Um, it's not um, anything broader or different or anything like that, it's just having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone over video. Um, I've been doing it in Hunter, New England for about five years or so. Um, this is one of those great graphs that start low and go up at the, the right-hand side. This is clinical telehealth consultations done through video conferencing um, uh, in Hunter, New England over whatever that is, six years. And there's been a great increase um, of a safe, effective way of communicating with patients um, for their, their clinical needs. Um, I'm going to show you a whole lot of different ways that it's been used before I move into the interpreting side. But this is a, a neurosurgeon uh, communicating to a patient at home on their home device. This is a general outpatient appointment. Um, on one screen, the neurosurgeon has the scans, the information, everything they need anyway. On the other screen, they've got the patient. They have that consultation. It works, it's effective, it's safe. This is a young boy that lives near Narrabri. He broke his wrist. Um, the only hand surgeons are in Newcastle. That's six hours away. You need to have five follow-up consultations if you break your wrist with the orthopedic surgeons. So typically that means five trips from Narrabri down to Newcastle to see an orthopaedic surgeon for an appointment that is generally no more than four minutes. He's on his way to school, it's done on his mother's iPad, and it's a, a radiology examination and a, a quick hand movement. <coughs> Aboriginal chronic care. Um, this is a Dr Pat Oakley who's on the computer screen. He's linking through to a lady in uh, Mungandai, which is about eight hours away from Newcastle. Um, she wouldn't be seen typically otherwise. She'd miss out on appointments, which is a, a reality of our healthcare. Um, supported by a nurse, supported by an Aboriginal health worker. A, a podiatrist, a young, enthusiastic podiatrist who's doing a high-risk foot clinic from Newcastle again, which is our hub for Hunter New England, linking up to, to Musselbrook community nurses. It's an upskilling opportunity for, for the nursing staff up there, um, but it means that that patient doesn't need to travel down. They're not getting lesser care, they're not, uh, not receiving care, it's just a different mode of how they're receiving it. And I guess to go back a step, this is a change in our health provision that has to happen. Um, because of cost restraints, access, availability, we need to start doing this. Uh, New South Wales is light years behind Queensland, Victoria, Canada, uh, the USA, um, all of Europe. You know, if you go to Spain, this is quite normal. New South Wales, Sydney, it's just frowned upon. This is a, a, a wound review from one hospital to another, so no inter-hospital transport required. Um, plastic surgeon at the, the teaching facility, patient stays in the smaller facility without needing an ambulance transfer. One of our amazing oncologists linking through to a patient in a private hospital, um, but you'll see, if I can get this to work, just there, that's the patient's son in England, linked in. We've had many of these sort of three, four, five way links, and we've included interpreters in some of them. Um, so that you've got multiple people connected in a, in a video link. This is a phenomenal project where police and ambulance in Port Stephens um, video conference from an acute mental health episode where they've been called to the mental health team in Newcastle. For police, it's a three-hour round trip to pack someone up, get them down to the, the psychiatric hospital, and then for them to uh, finish 
um, their handover and get back up to Port Stephens. They're linking on an iPad through to the mental health facilities. The evaluation of this, 60 patients in six months, 57 didn't go down to the, the mental health facility. They were treated through video conferencing by uh, healthcare nurses, social workers. They had follow-up appointments booked, a whole range of things. It worked. Every school in, in New South Wales has video conferencing equipment. This is a, a nurse educator linking through to a school to explain anaphylaxis and epilepsy uh, to a group of students and teachers because there's a, a two kids that, um, one with epilepsy and one with um, allergies. So it's a way of training. Again, another neurosurgeon, and I keep bringing up neurosurgeons because if you can get a neurosurgeon to do anything, you can get anyone to do anything. <laughs> um, neurosurgeon connecting through to Cessnock High Security Prison. Um, there's no lesser care here for this prisoner. The justice health nurses are part of the care now rather than them being removed, but there's no transport requirements. It can take six hours to get a high security inmate out of a jail, transported through, and if you work in any teaching hospitals, that, that walk of shame that uh, prisoners need to do is, is horrific for them. There's none of that, it is better. This is quite an amazing story. This is a mother and son, son in, in John Hunter Hospital, mother in, in Belmont Hospital. It's not very far away. Um, they did this about four or five times before the son died. So this was the last way they were able to communicate. It, each time would go for an hour or so. Um, and they'd have these lovely conversations that you don't have over the phone because you, you're seeing each other. There was conversations about, you know, he's not looking, you know, all that well with those glasses on. You know, he, he needs to change his glasses. Little things like that that are just sweet. Um, and she liked looking at her hair in the, in the video. Um, I've blurred this man's face. He, he's dying at this point. Um, and his wife, who's on that video conference, is in an in a aged care facility. She can't come and be with him when he dies. So they did this. We, we actually have a lot of these connections from John Hunter Hospital. We've linked all around the world for connections like this. Um, we've got... Uh, we did a pitch to the Minister of Health a few years ago and got a, a huge amount of um, uh, devices um, for being able to link end-of-life care to people around the world. Uh, this is a man, he was in a car accident, brain injury, lives on a farm some four hours away from the hospital. His only concern was his horses. The occupational therapists had to go back to his home to... Um, to do their work in, in for him to be able to be discharged, and they linked through to show him his horses, which is just, again, the soft side of videoing that you can't get in other ways. So, tele Telehealth is a secure way for patients and health professionals to connect remotely via video conferencing over the internet. Hunter New England Health uses Scopia, it's similar to Skype or FaceTime, though it's encrypted, it's confidential, and it's safe. When clinically appropriate, telehealth can be used in the care we provide and can benefit patients, families, and clinicians. With telehealth, we can connect patients to their loved ones and carers from a hospital bed. If you're a patient, provided you have an internet connection, you can set up Scopia on your computer, smartphone or tablet. It's free. Go to the Hunter New England Health telehealth website. From here, follow the prompts. Download and install, then you're ready to go. There's a test site to check your connection. The test site number is 665-9000. If you need to, ask a friend or family member to help you set this up. A Hunter New England Health employee will provide you with a meeting ID and a time for your connection with us. When the time comes to connect via Scopia, both the patient and the clinician will enter the same meeting ID. The clinician will enter their secure PIN and then you're connected. Just spend five minutes and you'll have it worked out easy. 
And don't forget we have our telehealth support team here to help. Telehealth is a real breakthrough and is saving precious time and money. It's an exciting opportunity for Hunter New England health professionals and their patients. So in Hunter New England, we've, we've invested in telehealth. We've got a couple of telehealth implementation officers, which was my role before I came into this. And as you can see, you know, the, similar to an earlier graph, there's this period of resistance or, you know, when we're working up the guidelines and arguing about consent and whether it's secure and whether you can do it and whether it will work there or here or whatever. And then it started improving. And it's got patient benefits. So we've done some 36,000 appointments. Um, that's over 5 million kilometres of patient travel that has been saved. Some 13,000 nights away from home saved for, for patients. And so that's, that's estimated on over five hours of travel. One way is a night away from home. It all adds up for patients. So this isn't health costs, this is patient costs. Around $10 million in patient costs saved and some 30,000 uh, tonnes of carbon emissions saved. So it's got great benefits and we're doing this great job, aren't we? So the great white hope was, you know, get this guy from telehealth, get him into, um, into interpreting services and we'll get this happening because with interpreting services, while it's not a two-day wait, certainly, having that access needs to be quicker. One of the biggest users of telehealth is mental health because non-verbal cues are so important. And in interpreting, non-verbal cues are extremely important. And it works. So in Auslan, and the, the deaf community have been videoing for an exceptionally long time and it works really well. This is our, um, our staff, Auslan interpreter, linking through to a, a dental clinic um, in Dubbo. So we did another video. This auto starts interesting. As service providers, we all have a responsibility to ensure we deliver quality, safe healthcare. The use of professional healthcare interpreters ensures we do just that. It is important to provide an interpreter when communicating to patients with limited English or people who are deaf because we need to ensure clear communication between health provider and patient. We have a duty of care to ensure all patients can understand their clinicians in order to help improve the safety of patient care. If there's the slightest feeling that your patient does not understand what you are saying, you must consider using an interpreter. You can access an interpreter in emergency department, in hospital, at the bedside, during appointments, home visits and phone calls. And with new technologies, interpreters are now more accessible than ever. Now available over video, we are bringing a face-to-face -face interpreter to you within minutes. Simply book, test and go. stuff isn't it um, and so this is typically where people would walk off the stage and there'd be this big clap and everyone would say what a great job we're doing and you know everyone wants to work in Hunter New England and everyone wants to employ me <laughs> um, you'll notice I, I called the, the topic non-fiction so I, I need to be honest with you of what's actually happening this is a great tweet um, it's it's quite old but it's a really good tweet of what particularly you guys in, um, in the university world would say a lot. <laughs> and it's what us in healthcare and management see all the time as well, things going up. So let's go back to this graph. Yeah, it looks really impressive. At this point here, which is just a little bit before I left to come into the role I'm in at the moment, that some thousand odd uh, clinical telehealth appointments per month. That's just 1.2 per cent of Hunter New England's monthly outpatient oncology and community appointments. It's barely touching the service service surface. But and this is where my rant at the beginning of New South Wales and where we are with video conferencing, it is 54% of the telehealth activity in this state. 
So if you think about those photos and how powerful and moving and, and important and useful they all are, and the figures of, um, uh, of savings, particularly to patients, five minutes, um, we're, we're not doing what we can and what we should be doing. So, healthcare interpreters, which is, you know, I guess what I should be talking about. Hunter, New England, so we service some uh, six districts and also schools and, and uh, other organisations. We do around 2,000 appointments a month. It's going up um, at, a, at a fairly good rate. Our video interpreting. So a bit of a zoom on the video interpreting that we're doing. It's not as impressive as what I would certainly like to see. Um, the most we've done at one point was 25 in one month. Um, but it's, you know, now it's still 1%, I guess. And it's only taken a few months to get to 1% rather than six years to get to 1%. So, you know, maybe that's good. But it comes down to all the problems, all the issues. And when you're trying to do... Um, something like video interpreting, whose job is it to book this and make this happen? Is it the interpreters? Is it the booking office? Is it the clinician? Is it the patient? Everyone has a, a different idea and a different desire for what they're going to have. So it's where we need to start thinking very differently. How are we going to do this? We know we've got cost problems. We know we've got access problems. How are we going to change the model? And it is happening elsewhere. So this is an amazing hospital in America, in St. Louis in America. It's got some 450 full-time equivalent staff and it doesn't have a single bed. So the whole hospital is full of nurses, doctors and they have interpreters that all work there. There's also virtual arms of it where people can work from home, people can work at other facilities in different hubs. And they connect through to other hospitals. They connect through to nursing staff in the home, to nurse, uh, aged care facilities, to different ways, different models of how we're providing healthcare. And it is happening and it is going to happen. So it's where we need to really rethink where we're going, you know, and it, it's people in this room and it, it's leading that discussion. We need to accept and we need to fund innovation because innovation is going to happen and changes are going to happen. We are going to have apps communicating with patients. We are going to be video conferencing. We are going to be using virtual reality and 3D printing and all of those sort of things in healthcare. But we've got to actually accept that and it's got to be funded properly. We need to create the policy and the research. So there's always a problem with healthcare where it's like, oh, wouldn't it be great if that's researched? And then we wait for the universities to come to us and say, let's research this. We actually need to drive that and work with our, our research partners and our universities and um, the institutes to actually make the research happen. But the problem with waiting for research as well is We've got about 60 different telehealth projects being researched, but we're not going to get the results for years. And we can't wait because we've got to implement change and we've got to make the change happen. So that's where we create the guidelines and the policy around it and then have the research continue to inform that. But we've also got to embrace that things are going to change. Um, there, you would have seen in the little uh, speech bubbles things like... Um, you know, I'm retiring soon or it's not my job or whatever. Management actually needs to actively argue against that and make the change happen and embrace what, what is the future. And that's it.